استغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله تعالى عليه واله وصحبه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار ثم اما بعد i begin in sha allah ta'ala with the greetings of the people of paradise assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh from the sunan characteristics of the anbiya of allah jalla wa ala from the recommended and preferred actions of the prophets and messengers of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that allah jalla wa ala allowed them encouraged them to marry allah jalla wa ala says min ayatihi an khalaqa lakum min anfusikum azwaja litaskunu ilayha وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ And from the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنْفُسِكُمْ That he created from you أَزْوَاجَةً Partners People to marry لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا So that you may find peace and tranquility in them وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And then he subhanahu wa ta'ala made for you both مَوَدَّةً and رَحْمَةً Love, affection and mercy إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Indeed, these are the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those who ponder about Allah jalla wa ala and his greatness and his magnificence subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said النِّكَاحِ من سنتي that nikah is from the sunnah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. The Anbiya of Allah جل وعلا used to all marry. In the Qayyim al-Jawziya رحمه الله تعالى, he explains and he discusses the concept of why people marry. What's their goal? What's their objective? What do they intend to achieve through marriage? And he mentions رحمه الله تعالى a number of different reasons why people often marry. And these reasons can be found in today's day and age as well. People marry because perhaps they find it to be cultural. It's a tradition of theirs to get married at a particular age. They want to settle down. They want to have children. They like the person that they're marrying or vice versa. There are many reasons a person gets married. And he mentions, rahimahullah ta'ala, a very key and important ingredient that will help every single marriage in this dunya and in the akhirah and allow every marriage to be successful he says after mentioning a number of reasons he says that the greatest reason the greatest goal or objective that a person can find or look for when he intends to get married is that he or she marries because they understand that marriage is ibadah they marry because marriage is an act of worship. They marry because they want to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They marry because they understand that through marriage, they attain the pleasure and the happiness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Through marriage, they get reward. Through marriage, they are closer towards the mercy of Allah jalla wa ala. To, through marriage, they are able to acquire and attain high levels of paradise. What I would like for you to do, or brother or sister in Islam, is to take a few steps back and just think about this point. Marrying for the purpose of ibadah. Marrying for the purpose of worship. What does this mean? And what does worship mean? Allah Jalla wa'ala says, and we've all, across, we've all come across this ayah a number of times in the Quran. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created jinn or man except 
to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in essence, our purpose for our existence in this dunya is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what is worship? What is worship? The scholars of Islam, they explain, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala from amongst them, they explain that in the Arabic language there are many different levels of love. You have a love that is based upon lust. You have a love whereby a person loves his son. And this love is different to the love a person has for his father or his mother. Or is different between the love that he has or he shares for his company or his business. Or even today, his football team that he supports. The clothes that he wears. These are all different levels of love. Right? They're all different levels of love. We love all of these things differently. Ibn al-Qayyim explains. And he says, rahimahullah ta'ala, that the highest, greatest level of love in the Arabic language has a name. And that name is Ibadah. That name is Ibadah. Ibadah in the Arabic language means the highest possible level of love. Whereby you would leave absolutely everything in order for the one that you love to be happy with you and you happy with them. And so when now Allah Jalla wa ala tells us that he has created us for ibadah. What is, he, what is he saying? He has created us to give him the highest possible level of love. A type of love whereby you will sacrifice your, your lust. You will sacrifice your desires. You will sacrifice perhaps some of the goals that you have in this dunya. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now when we think about marriage. And we look to the words of Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala when he said, marry for ibadah. What is he saying, Jalla wa'ala? Why is he saying, rahimahullah ta'ala? That when a person marries and he has in his heart the goal and the objective of not just ibadah, but wanting to do this to please Allah so that Allah can love him and he can show his love to Allah Jalla wa'ala the entire dimensions of a person's marriage life changes completely. No longer does marriage become orders or commandments or prohibitions that you must adhere to or stay away from. No longer does marriage become simply making the other person happy or just being with them for the sake of your children perhaps. But the dimensions of marriage change. The goalposts have changed. You are now married or you are pursuing marriage for the sake of Allah Jalla wa'ala. And thus every dealing you now have with your wife or the wife has with her husband, every dealing, every statement, every gathering, every sitting, every look, every smile, every touch is done with the goal to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is done with the goal to please Allah Jalla wa'ala. To make Allah Jalla wa'ala love you. And to show Allah Jalla wa'ala that you love him. And this is why, as some of the scholars explain these words of Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala. That when a person traverses upon the path of marriage with the intention of ibadah. He lives a life with his wife in this dunya. As if though he is living in the akhirah. As if though he's living in the Akhirah. Every single dealing with his wife is done with the goal and the intention to please Allah. And to make Allah love him. And to show that he loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The dimensions of marriage has changed. Marriage becomes something else. And you deal with your wife or the wife deals with her husband in a completely different way. And this is why True marriage, marriage done with the goal of ibadah, these forms of marriage last until the akhirah. Children are raised up in this home and they love to be raised up in this home. They love to be in the company of their parents because all they see when the father speaks to the wife or the wife speaks to the father, all they see are dealings 
blessed with love. Statements uttered, intending ibadah. Dealings done, intending closeness to Allah Jalla wa ala. The house becomes a house of ibadah. The parents become parents of ibadah. And the husband and wife become partners built upon ibadah. May Allah Jalla wa ala bless us by giving us a marriage based upon ibadah. May Allah Jalla wa ala give us that window of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even in our daily routine. Ameen. Today insha'Allah ta'ala, after this very small muqaddimah, this very small introduction, I would like to discuss some of the roles, rights and responsibilities that both a husband and wife should adhere to when marrying for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. MashaAllah, I see young children taking notes. A bit too early for your time, alhamdulillah. But alhamdulillah, I will encourage you to seek the path of knowledge. Amin. So what are these roles and responsibilities that both the husband and wife should have in order for the marriage to be successful, in order for them to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in order for Allah jalla wa ala to be pleased with them and love them as well. We said that marriage is built upon ibadah. It's built upon the goal and the objective of worship. And thus, if marriage is built upon the goal and the intention of worship, the rights and responsibilities a husband has for his wife and the wife has for her husband is to encourage one another to ibadah. Is to encourage one another to increase in their act of worship, in their dealings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah jalla wa ala says, وَجْعَلُوا He says, وَجْعَلُوا بُيُوتَكُمْ قِبْلَةً وَأَقِيمُوا As-salah. So and make your homes a qibla and stand up and perform the prayer. Make your homes a qibla and stand up and perform the prayer. Meaning the house in itself, the house of the husband, the house of the wife, the house of the father and mother should be a house of ibadah. Should be a house of ibadah. And thus the husband fixes the errors of the wife. And the wife fixes the errors of the husband. They are both trying their utmost to bring one another closer to the pleasure and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever they find a defect in a person's life, the dealings of Allah jalla wa ala, they speak to them in a loving way, words of wisdom they give in order for the person to come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because their goal as a husband, their goal as a wife, is to become husband and wife in the dunya, and husband and wife in jannah. Husband and wife in the dunya, and husband and wife in Jannah. This is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, in the hadith reported by Ahmad from Abu Hurair radiyallahu ta'ala an, he says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ رَجُلًا رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ رَجُلًا قَامَ مِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَصَلَّى وَأَيْقَذَ إِمْرَهَاتَهُ فَصَلَّتْ The Allah Jalla wa Ala has mercy upon the man that stands up at night. فَصَلَّى and he prays. وَأَيْقَذَ إِمْرَأَتَهُ فَصَلَّتْ And he wakes up his wife and he tells her to pray. And then he said, صلى الله عليه وسلم ورحمه الله إمرأة قامت من الليل فصلت وأيقذت زوجها فصلى And may the mercy of Allah جل وعلا be upon the woman that wakes up her husband at night. She prays and he prays as well. Abu Huraira radiyallahu ta'ala an, he used to split his nights into three sections. And he used to stand up at the first part of the night. Then he would wake up his wife and make her stand up the second third of the night. And then he would wake up his son or his children and make them stand up at the third part of the night. Was he radiyallahu ta'ala an, according to some narrations, would stand the entire night with himself then with his wife, and then with his children. A family that was built upon ibadah. Because they understood marriage is worship, and every dealing thereafter must be done in order to bring the slave of Allah Jalla wa ala to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. O brother, O sister in Islam, O husband, O wife in Islam, O one who is looking for happiness and success in your marriage, Look for ibadah. And look to see how to 
Rebuild your relationship with Allah because if you fix your relationship with Allah, Allah will fix your relationship with your spouse. If you build for yourself a mountain to stand and worship Allah, Allah Jalla wa will build for yourself and your wife a mountain together for you to come together. You worry about Allah, Allah will fix absolutely everything else. Marry with ibadah and then nourish and strengthen your relationship with Allah Jalla wa ala. And I swear to you by Allah Jalla wa ala, for the ones who help their spouses in worshipping Allah, Allah Jalla wa ala will help you. Allah Jalla wa ala will help you. Some of the scholars of Islam, they say that when a person marries, he must look for an act of worship that him and his wife can do together. You often find that husband and wife, they stay late at night and they watch movies or they watch different types of episodes on the TV. Or they discuss different articles that they perhaps read in the day. But how many of us as husband and wives find an act of worship that we do together? Look for an act of worship that you can do together. It's a right of your marriage. A right of your marriage to find an act of worship that you and your wife can do together. Whether it be reading a page of Qur'an, don't let a day go by except both of you read the Qur'an together. Don't just do it such that you do it in your room and then she does it in her time. But sit together. Sit together. Open the mushaf and read. Let her read an ayah and you read an ayah after. Let her read an ayah and you translate or you read and she translates. And then you both ponder about the tafsir of the ayah. Or stand up at night together just before fajr. You both perform two rak'ah two together. And if you can't do that, then look to some of the sahaba. What they would do is they would perform two rak'ah before they would go to sleep as qiyam al-layl. So after isha, they would perform two rak'ah as tarawih, or rather qiyam al-layl or tahajjud. Because they would find they'd be unable to wake up before fajr. Do this with your wife. Or look towards sponsoring an orphan. Both of you come together. If she is working and you're working, you both spend your money together in order to sponsor orphan or to foster a child. Look to the many different branches of ibadah and strengthen your relationship with Allah together. And Allah Jalla wa ala will strengthen your relationship with one another. For Allah Jalla wa ala loves those who take care of Him, Subhanahu wa Taala. He loves those who take care of Him, Subhanahu wa Taala. From the rights and responsibilities that Islam sees in a marriage is that it is the role of both the husband and the wife to try their absolute utmost to instill happiness in the hearts of their spouse. Their right, a right, a responsibility of the husband and the responsibility of the wife to try their utmost to instill in the hearts of their spouse absolute happiness. The Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said in a hadith that some of the scholars of Islam debate upon. Hadith reported by At-Tabarani, its meaning is correct. Some of the scholars of Islam have authenticated it, like Shaykh Al-Bani rahimahullah ta'ala. But it seems as if though Allah was best that it is weak. But its meaning is correct. Inshallah ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ahabbu nas ila Allah. That the most beloved people to Allah jalla wa ala are those who benefit others. Wahabbu al-ahmal. Wahabbu al-ahmal ila Allah. And the most beloved action to Allah jalla wa ala is entering happiness in the chests of the slaves of Allah jalla wa ala. Is entering happiness in the hearts of the Muslims. And what better way to start what better way to start than the home itself? What better way to start than your partner, your companion, your friend, your wife, who you both have traversed upon to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Begin by instilling happiness in the hearts of your spouse. And look to their emotion whenever you find them being unhappy. Try your utmost to make them happy. And likewise for the female slave of Allah jalla wa ala, for her husband. Look to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A man who's an example to each and every single one of us in a hadith reported by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. 
The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he saw that outside of his window there was a group from Habasha having some kind of play. They were playing in the Masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam on the day of Eid. So he called Aisha radiyallahu taala anha, and he asked her to rest her head on his shoulders, and she would look towards this play. And she narrates radiyallahu taala anha that she rested her chin in between his ears and her shoulder, and she looked. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked her if she was happy or content, and she wanted to look more. And she stayed looking. She stayed watching this play until she was happy. And then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, once finding out she was happy, he asked her to leave. Alayhi salatu wasallam, trying his utmost, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to instill in his wife's heart, radiyallahu taala anha, absolute happiness. He said, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in a hadith reported by Nasai, that كل شيء ليس من ذكر الله له ولا عبد. Everything that's not from the remembrance of Allah جل وعلا is a type of play and amusement, or a type of wasting your time. إلا أربعة أو إلا أن يكون أربعة. Except for four things, and he mentioned from amongst them a husband playing with his wife. A husband playing with his wife, meaning a husband trying his utmost to make his wife happy. And now we find that a number of us, we tease our wives, we mock them, we joke around with them. And we do this on a regular basis. Mocking them, we tease them. And there's no doubt there's some kind of playfulness in these forms of words that we say to them. But if it is done over and over and over again, the person is overcome with these words. Especially if the same is not said on the other side. So when we find the person always teases and he always mocks his wife, he should do double that in terms of making her happy or saying good words to her. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. From amongst the rights and responsibilities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for a husband and a wife is for both of them to treat one another with absolute respect and honor. He says, Jalla wa ala, Wallahunna mithu ladhi alayhinna bil ma'roof. Is upon you to deal with them just like how you how they dealt with you with good. Bil ma'ruf, eh? Yani speaking to them in absolute, with absolute respect. Speaking to them in a good way, treating them in a good manner. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Khayrukum, khayrukum li ahlihi. The best of you is the best of those who are to their families. The best of you in this world are those who are best to their families. And then he said, Wa ana khayrukum li ahli. And I am the best to my family. And I am the best to my family. The best of you in the face of this world are those who are best to their wives or best to their women folk. And so it's imperative upon us all, our brother, our sister in Islam, to deal with your spouse in a good manner. Respect them. Say good words to them. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha used to say, the Prophet ﷺ never ever raised his hands to myself or to any of his women. And he never raised his hands to his slave or to any of his children. And as Ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala and used to say that sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would ask me to do something. And when I forgot to do it, he never would ask me, why didn't I do this? And he would never raise his hands to myself or to any of his wives. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From amongst the etiquettes, the roles and responsibilities that Allah Jalla wa Ala has placed upon the husband and the wife is for both of them to share words of love. We spoke about general terms, general words of respect and general words of good. It is from the roles and responsibilities, the rights of a husband and the rights of a woman to tell one another that they love them. To tell one another that they love them. In fact, this was the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in a hadith reported by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. A person came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, ayyu nas ahabbu ilayk? Who from the people is the most beloved to you? Who from the people is the most beloved to you? 
قال he said صلى الله عليه وسلم عائشة رضي الله عنها he said صلى الله عليه وسلم his wife عائشة then the Sahabi said من الرجال يا رسول الله obviously she's your wife but from the men who who from the men do you love the most فقال he said أبوها her father ثم من he asked قال عمر رضي الله عنه a man came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and he asked the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم who the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم loved the most from the people the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that he loved Aisha رضي الله تعالى عنها he loved Aisha رضي الله تعالى عنها and he wasn't embarrassed to tell the people that he loved his wife he wasn't embarrassed to tell his wife that he loved him صلى الله عليه وسلم and this tells us or this teaches us a great important point and that is the Prophet وسلم, a man, a general, a soldier, the greatest of mankind, a messenger, a prophet, a man who had the highest level of rujula, of, of being a man. He was man enough to tell his wife that he loved her. And he was man enough to tell his friends, not just his friends, but the entire ummah from his time until the end of time. And have it reported and recorded in the books of hadith. Until the end of time that he loved his wife more than absolutely anyone from mankind. And the Prophet وسلم, was a man. And he wasn't afraid to let people know that he loved his wife. And this shows us, oh brother, oh sister in Islam, but in particular to your brothers, you don't lose any type of rujula. You don't lose being a man. By telling people or telling your wife that you love her. In fact, when you do so, Allah Jalla wa Ala loves you. Why? Because you've instilled in her heart happiness. And you've done something for the sake of Allah Jalla wa Ala. You've pleased Allah Jalla wa Ala. And this is what we talked about right at the beginning. Ibadah, marriage is ibadah. You enter marriage with the intention of ibadah. Any single possible way you've made your wife happy, you've made Allah Jalla wa Ala happy. Any way you've served your wife, you've made Allah Jalla wa Ala happy. Any way you've served your husband or you've instilled happiness in his heart, or you've said a good word to him, you've made Allah Jalla wa Ala happy. You've made Allah Jalla wa Ala happy. Look to some of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They didn't just love telling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that they loved him. But one day, a woman came with some hina. How do you translate henna? Henna, right? Right? He came, some, he came with some henna. She came with some henna to dye the hair of the wives of the Prophet. So she said that she dislikes the smell of this henna. She dislikes the smell of this henna. And she was asked, Why do you dislike the smell? You know, which woman dislikes the smell? And she said, I dislike the smell because I know the Prophet disliked the smell. I know the Prophet وسلم, dislikes this smell. So what did this wife of the Prophet want to do? What was her goal? To keep the Prophet وسلم, happy. To keep him happy. وسلم. Tell your wives that you love them. Be gentle with them. Give them good words. And be patient and hold yourself when you know that you're on the right. Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala is reported in it. As reported that Imam Ahmed in the Tabaqat al Hanabila, the Imam Ahmed ta'ala, from the wife of his son Salih, he said that he's been married with her for 20 years. He's been married with her for 20 years, and he said, I have never disputed with her even on one kalima. For 20 years, I've been married with her, and I haven't disputed with her even for one kalima. Shuraih, the great Qadi of Islam. Shuraih used to say, whilst calling his son, he said, I've lived with your mother for a number of years. I've lived with your mother for a number of years. And he also mentioned Ishreen, 20 years. And he said, I've never differed with her. I never became angry with her. I've never said anything other than gentle words to her. I've never differed with her except one time. And that one time, I was wrong, he said. I was wrong, he said. Another benefit we learn here, or brother or sister in Islam, is that you don't lose your manliness. You don't lose being a man by admitting your wrong 
to your wife. These great scholars of Islam, these great warriors of Islam, mentioned it for people to write down in their books for eternity. And people to discuss in gatherings like this. None of them were afraid to be someone lower than who they were. Uh, who they were. This characteristic, this right, is to tell your wives that you love them. From amongst the characteristics or the rights and responsibilities that Allah Jalla wa Allah has placed for both a husband and a wife is both of them must strive the utmost to conceal the secrets of the home. Both of them must strive the utmost to conceal the secrets of their home. In fact, Allah Jalla wa Allah says, فَالصَّالِحَاتُ قَانِتَاتٌ حَافِظَاتٌ لِلْغَيْبِ بِمَا حَفِظَ الله. That the pious, righteous female slaves of Allah Jalla wa Allah are those who conceal the unseen. Those who conceal the hidden things. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِنَّ مِنْ أَعْظَمِ الْخِيَانَةِ That the greatest form of treachery and the greatest way of taking someone's rights is for a man to enjoy his wife and then spill the secrets or expose the secrets of the wife the next day. Or likewise for a woman to enjoy her husband and then spill the secrets or tell about the secrets the next day. Now even though these ahadith are in particular in regards to intimate actions or the bodies of the husband or the wife, the scholars of Islam, they open it up to absolutely everything. There are secrets in the home. Your husband, your wife, acts in a way in front, in front of you that they may not act in front of other people. There may be somebody at home that they may not be outside. They may deal with you in a particular way they may not deal with others outside. Because their barrier has lowered. They make perhaps more mistakes, they stumble more, they err more. The role of a husband, the role of a wife in a marriage for the sake of Allah Jalla wa Ala is to hide these secrets. Hide your secrets. Don't hang out your dirty laundry for everyone to see. Clean your clothes at home. Clean your clothes at home. Hide the secrets of the family. No doubt there will be times that the husband has perhaps taken the rights of the wife. And no doubt there will be times where the wife has taken the rights of the husband. But just like how you, O oh brother in Islam, would dislike for your wife to speak about you to someone else and complain about you to someone else. Don't complain about her to someone else. Don't complain about her to someone else from the rights of a marriage is that you must keep what stays at home, stays at home. You must keep the secrets to home. The secrets of intimacy and the secrets of mistakes and the secrets of how one behaves with the other. Keep them at home. In fact, some of the pious and righteous slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they used to advise their daughters before they would get married, they would say to them, whenever your husband commands you to do something, then do it. Beautify yourself for your husband. And don't tell people what you find at home. Don't tell people what you see from him at home. And if there comes a time whereby the marriage is on its rocks, and you find perhaps the only solution is to go to somebody and to maybe complain to somebody in order for them to fix or try to help the marriage, then do so after discussing and agreeing with your spouse. Do so after agreeing and discussing with your spouse. Find a neutral person and then go to them and them alone and don't spill the secrets outside of that for the rights and responsibility of the husband and the wife is to conceal others' mistakes within the home. From the rights and responsibilities that the scholars of Islam mention regarding the husband and the wife is that they would share each other's emotions and help one another during times of difficulty and rejoice with one another in times of happiness. Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala an in a hadith reported by Muslim 
عندما دخل على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم he one day entered upon the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and he saw the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and Abu Bakr رضي الله تعالى عن he saw them both sitting and crying about something Umar bin Khattab رضي الله عن he entered upon the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and he saw the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and Abu Bakr رضي الله تعالى عن sitting and crying about something فقال عمر so Umar said يا نبي الله O prophet of Allah Tell me why you are crying, so that I may I may cry too. Tell me why you are crying, so that I may cry too. And then listen to what he says. Or I may force myself to cry as well. What do we learn from here? The scholars of Islam, they say that when you love somebody dearly, and from the explanations of this hadith, so when you love somebody dearly, you share their emotions when a husband becomes when a person when a man becomes a husband of somebody he marries his wife they become essentially one person one person striving the utmost to help one another to attain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thus they share in each other's emotion they share when a person becomes happy they become happy when you love somebody so dearly and he wants good for them so sincerely. You are happy when they are happy. And you are sad when they are sad. And even if you though, even if you can't make yourself sad, you will try your utmost to make yourself sad. As Allah says, and deal with them exactly like how they dealt with you with good. So when you see your spouses, when you see your wives going through a difficult time, perhaps they lost their father or they lost their sister or perhaps something has happened in the day that has caused them much upset and sadness. Share the same emotions as them. Share the same emotions as them. And what will this do? The scholars of Islam tell us that this only brings the heart of your spouse closer towards you. And allows them to have more affection and more love for you. When they are happy, even though something has gone wrong in your day, try your utmost to share happiness. Rejoice when they rejoice. Make yourself sad when they are sad. From the rights and responsibilities of a fruitful marriage in this dunya and the akhirah. That the husband and the wife, they share each other's emotions. They share each other's emotions. From the roles and responsibilities of a successful marriage that the scholars of Islam mention is that both husband and both wife must beautify themselves for one another. Both husband and wife must beautify themselves for one another. Again, Allah Jalla wa'ala says, وَلَهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Deal with them just like how they dealt with you with goodness and with khair. With goodness and affection. The husband wants his wife to be adorned, to be beautiful for himself. Every man will say the same. He wants to be able to go home after a long and difficult day of work and see his wife and look upon his wife and she's dressed up for him or she has made herself presentable for him. But does it make sense for a man to be able to expect this if he doesn't do the same for his wife? Does it make sense for the man to expect this if he doesn't do the same for his wife? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Sahaba were coming back from a battle. Were coming back from a battle, and they were approaching Medina. Hadith reported by Al Bukhari. They were approaching Medina. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to his companions, "Slow down a little bit." So that, we may be able, so that we may be able to enter Medina in the evening and not the day. Imagine a long travel. You've participated in a battle. You're on the way back. You'd want to go home quickly to be able to see your family and to see your children and be able to go home and relax at the comfort of your own homes. But he said to his companions, slow down, slow down. So that we may be able to enter into Medina at night. The Sahaba asked, why Ya Rasulullah? He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so that we may be able to have a ghusl and beautify ourselves 
and enter upon our homes so that our wives are pleased with us. The Prophet وسلم, as narrated by Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, whenever he would enter his home, he would use the siwak and clean his, t- clean his mouth. Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an, he used to say that I, beauty my, I beautify myself. I beautify myself for my wife because I want her to beautify herself for me. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna Allah jameelun. Yuhibbu al-jamal. Allah jalla wa ala is beautiful. And he loves beauty jalla wa ala. And thus, if you really want your wife to be presentable towards you, then be presentable for her. Use perfume. Clean yourselves after work. Remove the stains and remove the smells that you have when you go and play sports. Or you go to the gym. Beautify yourselves for your wives. And they will beautify themselves for you. From the rights and responsibilities. The roles of marriage is that husband and wife, they take care of their outward appearance. And doing so would enable both of them to beautify their inward appearance. Especially with regards to their dealings with one another. From the rights and responsibilities of marriage that the scholars of Islam, they mention, is that both husband and wife must have ghira, a protective form of jealousy for their spouse. Both husband and both wife must have ghira, a protective form of jealousy for their spouse. The Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said, There are three groups of people that will never, ever, ever enter Jannah. He said, Al-Aqli Walidayn, the one who is disobedient towards his parents. And then he mentioned specifically for this particular point, Adday Youth. What day Youth, he said. And what is Adday Youth? Adday Youth is the one who cares not about his wife mixing with men, his wife being in the company of men, or speaking to men in a manner whereby she's supposed to save and protect for her himself. And the youth is the one who has no form of protective jealousy for his wife or his mother or his sister or his daughters. But in regards to today's topic, his wife. He doesn't care how his wife and who his wife mixes with. He doesn't inquire about where she's gone. He doesn't know about her friends. He cares not about who she speaks to. He encourages her to sit in gatherings where there are men. And you often find, especially in today's day and age, brothers and sisters, they sit on mixed tables. Husbands speaking to other men's wives. And other men speaking to your own wife. And everyone's sharing a joke and looking at one another. Where is your protective jealousy? O slave of Allah Jalla wa'ala. Where is your protective jealousy? Ghira. Ghira is that you protect your wife from speaking to a foreign person in a manner whereby she would be speaking to you. In a seductive or in a manner whereby she could instill in the other person's heart some kind of love or lust for her. But on the point of ghira, O brother or sister in Islam, like there is in everything in the deen of Allah Jalla wa'ala, there are always two extremes. You have the one who cares not at all about his wife, allows her to do whatever she wants to do, speak to whoever she wants, go out in gatherings with men and women who expect or don't care about where the husband goes as well. He has friends that are women, he has friends that are men. He socializes with women, he socializes with men. Prohibit, O sisters in Islam, prohibit your husbands from working out in gyms where there are women. This is your ghira. And you have an Islamic right to do so. They'll be waking out in places where women are wearing tight clothes. It's natural for a man to fall in, fall in love or look, into these, look at these women with a lustful eye. Where's your ghira, or sister in Islam? Where's your ghira, or brother in Islam? And the other extreme is that wherever your husband goes, or wherever your wife goes, you want to know absolutely everything. And you question them with what? With, speci- with suspicion and not love. You question them with suspicion and not wisdom. She's received an innocent phone call from 
somebody who's made a mistake, who's dialed the wrong number. Or she's rang a number to ask for a delivery for a takeaway. Don't be too harsh with regards to your ghirat. No, there are, there are two extremes. Don't be suspicious and prohibit absolutely everything, even the thing that the Sharia allows. For the Sharia allows a male to speak to a woman where there is no fitna. So long as though the female safeguards her tongue and speaks in a manner whereby she prevents lust in the heart of the other person. The Sharia allows this. Women used to ask the Prophet ﷺ, and the Sahaba would ask the mothers of the believers. And some of the Sahaba learned from women, great teachers of Islam. The voice in itself is not awrah, but the voice can become awrah. Depending upon how the man chooses to use his voice or the female chooses to use her voice. Protect your husbands and protect your wives before you'd find that they will be taken by someone else. The rules of the Sharia of Allah Jalla wa ala have been decreed by the greatest Allah Jalla wa ala to prevent fitna, to prevent haram, to prevent zina, to prevent adultery. It's just a shame. That as the slaves of Allah, we don't exercise these methods that Allah Jalla wa'ala has given us, subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the rights and responsibilities that a husband has and a wife has in their married life, as the scholars of Islam mention, is that they have the right to enjoy one another when they please. Both the husband and both the wife. They should be able to enjoy intimacy whenever they wish, insha'Allah ta'ala. So long as though the husband and the wife in this circumstance, they are just with regards to when they ask for this. You find a number of brothers in Islam, they use the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِذَا دَعَى رَجُلْ إِمْرَأَتَهُ إِلَى فِرَاشِهِ They use the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that when a man calls his wife to his bed, and she rejects, and he sleeps angry, then the angels of Allah curse her until the morning. And some of them abuse this right from Allah Jalla wa Ala. Some of them abuse this right from Allah Jalla wa Ala. Know that your wives are human beings. They also have long, tiring days. Some of them perhaps work. Some of them spend the entire days at home, preparing and cleaning, and looking after the home for their in-laws, or perhaps their children, or perhaps yourselves. So be considerate when you ask for something. And likewise for the woman, because even though this hadith is specifically for a man, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah ta says, it doesn't make sense that when a woman has desires also, and she asks her husband to fulfill these desires, and her husband says no, he says, it doesn't make sense for Allah Jalla to excuse the, the woman or excuse the man from any sin. No doubt the man should be sinful as well. And so both one another has a right and responsibility to enjoy one another. And remember, you are enjoying one another for the sake of Allah Jalla wa'ala. Every act between you two is a means of you getting closer to Allah. Is a means for Allah Jalla wa'ala being pleased with you. Is a means of you raising your rank in Jannah. From the rights and responsibilities, and we'll end in this, on this note, inshaAllah ta'ala, is that both husband and both wife should be absolutely ameen ma'al akhar to be ameen and ma'al akhar as in you should be trustworthy and reliable a source of trust a companion a friend to the other person no brother or sister in Islam your wives are not enemies your wives are partners are companions that are holding your hands towards a path of success, towards a path of pleasure, towards a path of Jannah. You need them to be able to attain Jannah, and they need you to be able to attain Jannah. There is no one on this earth that knows you better after Allah Jalla wa ala and yourselves than your spouses. No one who knows the secrets of your errors or where you are falling behind, or how you need to raise yourself to be able to enter Jannah. 
and what you need to be able to do to answer your questions in the grave correctly. No one knows these better than your wives. And so be trustworthy to them. Be a source of reliance, a source of trust, a source of respect and honor for your spouses. Be their companion. Hold their hands. And remember that Allah Jalla wa'ala has promised both of you Jannah so long as though you help one another to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's paradise. Allah Jalla wa'ala and how eloquently can someone say this when he says subhanahu wa ta'ala hunna libasun lakum wa antum libasun lahunna hunna libasun lakum wa antum libasun lahunna they are your garments and you are their garments and what does he mean when he says libas why did he choose this ayah why did he choose this word the scholars of Islam they say what does a garment achieve a garment conceals your skin conceals your private parts conceals what is most honorable and private towards you and so the husband and the wife they conceal every secret they conceal every private matter for you a garment gives you warmth in these cold days we wear extra clothing we wear jackets, we wear jumpers, we wear double layers of socks when we go outside. Just to keep warm. Libas, we wear different garments. Allah calls your wife a garment and you a garment so that they keep you warm. They keep you warm from what? They protect you from the arrows of the shaitan. They protect you from the arrows of the shaitan. Because if you go out in the cold not wearing anything, you would die. If you go out, or brother or sister in Islam, without your husband or your wife protecting you, giving you that extra clothing, telling you where you're falling short, and what you need to be able to do to fulfill Allah Jalla wa'ala's pleasure, you're going to fall short. A garment also, we wear, we select garments, based upon sometimes how the garment looks like, right? Some of us, we go to shops and we spend extra from, our, from what we have to be able to buy nice clothes. And we choose nice garments with good labels, some of us. And why do we do that? Because we believe this is a source of adornment. We believe this type of clothing makes us look better. Your wives would make you better. They will beautify you. And you, O oh brother in Islam, will beautify them. The only thing that needs to happen is that you need to be able to, or rather we need to be able to help one another and allow one another to help us. May Allah Jalla wa ala allow us to be prosperous in this dunya. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al-aziz al-jabbar al-mutakabbir al-rahman al-rahim give us a pious and righteous wife. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be pious and righteous in our dealings with her. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to find Jannah in this dunya and allow us to have this Jannah in the akhirah. I call the Holy Hadha, I was 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 the Holy Hadha, I was